Permafrost Cascade! That's the only spell I can remember off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and with that lovely introduction, welcome to this week's episode of the 800, the first of 2022. I'm your host, <laughs> Alex, and you just heard from my magical co-host, Adam, and a special shout out to the man behind the curtain, the Wizard of Oz. I don't know. <laughs> it, I'm getting some feedback from somebody. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not uh, sure why. Strange. Thanks for dealing, uh, putting up with that, folks. But uh, anywho, <laughs> th- uh, the Wizard of Oz, I think, just fixed it. So thank you for that, Alan. <laughs> Anyways, let's move on to our plugs <laughs> after <laughs> that crazy introduction. Uh, if you joined us before the show, you heard some music. That was Fearless First by Incompetech. Incompetech has super duper awesome uh, scores and other musical awesomeness you should check them out uh at the uh, incompetech.filmmusic.io <clears throat> uh also um uh we have a youtube channel you should check that out uh it's uh, linked below the video it's a uh, DM's table on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing so good this okay. year. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to type at the same time, and it's not working out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> YouTube links below the video. We post all of our videos there. <laughs> uh, and also, I listen to audiobooks. You should, too. Uh, Audible will give you a free one month trial and one free book if you check them out. Uh, if you want to do that, go to dmstable.com slash audible. Audiobooks really le- uh, uh, lend another sense to reading because it's audio instead of just visual. Um, but anyway, it's cool. You should check that out. And finally, uh, we have a Patreon. Patreon link is below the video too. Uh, at Patreon, you can get cool features and stuff. Uh, most noteworthy is the fact that you get to vote on what book we read next. The vote is still ongoing, so if you're joining us, go ahead and check that out and vote before it's too late and it's closed. And then you'd have to wait a whole nother sesh before you get to vote again. And love uh, is in the air for this boat, so keep that in mind. Romance novels. <laughs> 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 Anyways, uh, this week on the 800s, we will be discussing our first book of the new year. Yes, via straight, we are in the future with Sufficiently Advanced Magic by Andrew Rowe. First book of the Arcane Ascension series. This book is experienced through the eyes of Corin Cadence, a young man trained from childhood to fight so that he might take on the challenges of the Serpent Spire. Should he survive the trials of the tower, he will be granted an attunement, a magical mark granting him, similarly, magical powers. And legend has it that those rare few who reach the top of the tower will be granted a great boon by the goddess that inhabits the tower itself. Corrin believes this is the only way to reunite, to be reunited with his long-lost brother and restore his family. But what awaits Corrin is far more than he ever bargained for. That was good. You should write them for, like, Audible or someone. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's going to be my new job, just writing the little blurbs in the back of, on, like, the back of book covers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyway, if this is your first time joining us tonight, I'll give you the rundown of how this works. Uh, Essentially, Alex and I are going to pose a topic, either from our own thoughts and imaginings, or one that was posed in chat. Uh, And we'll discuss it while you guys have a chance to fill in comments inside the chat bar. Um, And then we'll throw it over to you guys and talk about whatever you have to say. And, of course, if you have something you want to talk about, as previously mentioned, throw it in chat. And we'll grab it and put it up there for everyone to talk about. Uh, it's the best best way to uh, integrate this into a group setting is to pose your own topics. So throw them up there if you got them. 
And as usual, a quick reminder, this uh, live stream book club is geared towards adults. We cover adult topics and scenarios. And while we try not to rely too much on swearing, it does happen from time to time. Also, we are trying to create a fun and supportive environment here at DM's Table in the 800s where people can just enjoy their uh, hobbies and the things that they love without fear of any kind of judgment or anything. So, in short, be nice or fuck off. <laughs> Alex is uh, straightforward for 2022. Yeah, 2022, the year of emphasis. <laughs> <laughs> emphasis. <laughs> With that, let's get it going with our uh, usual uh, beginning topic. What were your initial thoughts of the book? Uh, this, like, right from the get-go gave me huge, like, RPG-style vibes, whether that's tabletop or, uh, in fact, like, a big portion of it for me got uh, gave me a JRPG vibes, like Japanese RPGs, in particular when, like, the first monster in the tower is a slime. Like, that's such, like, <laughs> Dragon Quest vibes there, <laughs> you know. Um, and the magic system itself kind of gave me similar vibes um, where there's all sorts of stuff regarding it that is, like, uh, yeah, there's kind of classes of different kinds, and the magic itself has different types, and there's subtypes within those types, and that's just all JRPG to me, which I tend to enjoy but the other thing that that does for me and we'll talk about this a bit more later is that kind of can suck me more into the mechanics of something than the story but uh yeah and i kind of felt that starting right from the beginning but that also happens a little bit when you're just introducing something new and big like that so yeah we'll talk more about how that went as i read on but what were your first impressions adam yeah, same same with me. Um, you know, this is a classic structure for a fantasy story with magic. Um, it's got great structure. It's it's very straightforward with exactly how everything works, but it leaves enough room to grow into infinite spells and channels of ways of using your magic. Right, so uh, it's. Uh, very, very fantasy, and uh, that's just what I like. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have struck right there. Uh, VS Drake says that they thought it was going to be a new flavor of Harry Potter. I'm assuming that's probably because of like the school setting. Uh, you know, once uh, Corin is through the tower, you know, he said, I think he says, like, right up front, right at the beginning, that, like, after you get an attunement, which is, you know, your type of magic that you do, like, kind of think of, like, a school of magic for those of you who uh, play, like, D&D types of games, and then you have to go into, mil- like, school and military service as a part of that as well. Yeah. And like the higher you get in the school, the less military service you have to do because they're kind of like interjoined. But yeah, I can see the Harry Potter vibe with that. But yeah, it does. Do, you know, I think that's not just a Harry Potter thing, though, because it's pretty common when you have a complex mag- magic system to find a means to explore it. And a lot of times that's through training of some kind, whether that be at a school or whether that be with a mentor. So I wasn't as concerned about it winding up being Harry Potter, especially because the magic system is nothing like Harry Potter, which is everybody can do everything as long as they, you know, just don't suck at magic. <laughs> you, know, you know, whereas this is, you kind of have to be specialized. And that's probably the part that makes it the farthest away from D and D is they don't technically get to choose, although apparently there's some level of familial uh, propensity for certain types of magic, but like that gets thrown out the window pretty freaking quick with <laughs> the main character. <laughs> you know, uh, what, what I'm trying to remember the exact attunement. Uh, I think it was Shaper. 
or something like that that his father and his father's father and his father's father's father were which yeah, lends something. itself to like which lends itself to like combat and he winds up being an enchanter which is the make magical tools <laughs> yeah the non-combat mark yeah one of one of the one of the two two specifically mentioned non-combat marks shaper yeah. and diviner well for that specific tower which we find out like as you said like the world as it expands offers up a lot of possibilities depending on where you received your attunement uh and stuff like that so while we're on that topic why don't we just go straight into it? What did you think of the magic system? Like, what were your favorite or least favorite parts? Yeah, VS Drake just threw that out there too. What is your favorite attunement currently? Cur- uh, well, <laughs> why don't why don't we start with that and then we can just kind of lean into. So how how about what is your favorite attunement and what did you think of the magic system overall? How's that? Why don't you go? Yeah, yeah. I got that going in. So why don't you go ahead and start us off, Adam? Yeah. So. Um, so I really liked the summoner two minute. Uh, I thought that was uh, pretty cool and probably overpowered because it seemed like they could summon things that could then do things beyond their own skill. Like, um, Sarah continuously throughout the book summoned that, uh, the winged guy. What was his name? Um, oh, I, I know you're talking about. Uh, I think she called him a Carvenzi at one point. Yeah, that that's like the race, but he had a name that started with a yeah. V. Uh, there are so many na- there are so many names to keep track of in this book. It <laughs> got a little difficult. Um, let's see here i brought up the wiki here just so that i would have names ready for a lot of stuff and there the wiki is <laughs> so, uh well, Va- well, vaniv that's the one vaniv 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 Veniv. yeah vaniv the one that the narrator gave that silly voice to <laughs> <laughs> but no, i think you know vaniv was obviously way more powerful than any of the students and yet sarah could summon him and still cast additional spells. So, summoners were obviously a force to reckon with. Um, I think the author kind of knew that too, because he ended up uh, cutting cutting her power pretty severely at the end. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> um, Enchanter, though, is obviously really cool. Um, you know, just the art artificiary of chanting is ideal uh, i think orden showed that uh, very well at the end there when she was like listen up here bitches i'm gonna fuck you all up and you have no idea what i'm capable of <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah the the magic system as a whole uh, i liked the structure it was very specific like okay you've got this attunement you have access to this specific magic and this is how your magic works uh, it was very well defined, uh, very well thought out. So, big fan. <laughs> How about your thoughts? <laughs> All right. Uh, so, I had a lot of trouble like picking a favorite. I, I probably just because we saw so much of it and how it could be used. Uh, I like the potential of the Enchanter, like the potential for it, but I think it just didn't get tapped into like the possibility of it. Because I have this feeling that down the road it's going to there's gonna be more possibilities for it. But from what we actually saw, yeah, I agree. Sumner was probably my favorite of at least from the uh, Serpent Spire, but I they talked about some from like other, uh, uh, like some other ones that you can uh, from like other spires that you can get, and yeah, like I, like Jin had the Mesmer attunement. Yeah, and there's one that I, well, the other one I think that was my favorite was the Soul Blade. Yeah, I, I thought the Soul Blade Derek, was Derek's. 
Attunement. Yeah, Derek. Yeah, Derek's attunement. <laughs> like, I thought the Soul Blade one was pretty cool because it kind of combines Summoner with Enchant with Enchanter, like in a middle ground, and so it kind of combines my two favorites. So I think Soul Blade is probably the one that comes out as my overall favorite, uh, at least that we've seen so far. Because what there's six spire, six potentially seven spires, and all of them supposedly have. Different like, attunements, se like seven or eight different attunements that you can get, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Which you know, again, like you said, there's so many possibilities for the magic. And one of the things that I found interesting, but kind of hard to follow, was the fact that there is different mana types. Uh, like there's a primary, a secondary, and can't remember if outright said it, but there's kind of an implication that there might even be a tertiary. To it. Yeah, so everybody has gray mana, and then they have the two that their attunement grant, and then when they get powerful enough, they get access to a third. Yeah, okay, so it did, yeah, so like that in and of itself allows for like these many combinations within your own magic, which is cool, and then the idea that you can combine magic spells with other people's attun with other people's attunements and uh, their man, uh, their mana types as well to complement each other to create like effectively an infinite number of spells, and it makes me want to figure out like you know how that stuff works because you know they talk about some of it like the like ma uh, mana's uh, deflect like um, Oppos opposites absorb. <laughs> 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 and potentially explode. <laughs> and, except not not same or opposites explode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, but there are ways for them to be complementary too. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, I and it seems like the types of mana specifically fit the general theme of the type of attunement too, which I thought was a nice touch, you know, like an enchanter is transference and mental. And I don't remember what the third is for it, but you know, that makes sense that you would transfer magic into something else. And that probably requires a lot of mental concentration to do uh, fire and air being combined to create lightning for elementalists kind of makes sense. Uh, Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, like, well, lightning. If we're gonna go Avatar: the Last Airbender route, is just like an enhanced version of fire. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's but that's also a pretty common trope in like JRPGs too. Is that the higher order? You know, you have a base. Well, you have the a base circle of elements, and then you can do higher order combinations with advanced enough training. Like that's a pretty common thing. So like again, I, I I was fairly familiar with that type of feeling going into the magic system itself. Yeah. Anyways, uh, let's get into uh, our chance got going here. So VS Drake, love the magic system. It was detailed, but I had enough wiggle wiggle room. Love the enchanter attunement, but I, I'm a person that must make an <laughs> yeah <laughs> VS Drake. I imagine uh, the enchant uh, the enchanter is probably for every. Any person who uh, 3D prints or <laughs> engineers stuff, that's their, you know, the artificers in our lives probably love that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it is super deep. Uh, and it, yeah, it, it's not the same everywhere. Just like we covered it, it. The fact that it varies from like region to region, I thought was pretty cool. Uh, I... What it makes me want to know is get more into the lore of like why certain uh, in attunements are uh, like if there's like a theme behind the attunements for each spire, you know, because we, we only see like a, a small smattering of different attunements from other areas. And it's hard to tell like if there's a theme to any of them other than this one and... 
you know, they seem pretty basic coming from the Serpent Spire, but the other ones seem to have a little more, I don't know, like specified kind of feels like. Like uh, if we look at the Soul Blade or um, Jin's Mesmer that we find out about at the very end, like it seems more specified than something that is kind of well-rounded like an elementalist or enchanter or guardian or summoner like they seem pretty broad at least to me yeah what do you what do you think about did you pick up on any themes that i might have missed um theme themes overall or like in a specific well themes specifically for like the in the uh, for the attunements like based on their spire yeah i didn't really notice anything specific but obviously we only get a small glimpse at other spire attunements so like there could be something there <laughs> yeah so well you well then uh, well maybe we'll save that for the uh predictions as to whether or not we think they're going to be uh themed yeah. or they're just random as hell <laughs> VS, VS Drake asks, why are they not on the mainland? Um, I, did, I didn't pick up on an island setting. I do know they have a shield over their entire country that doesn't allow any entry or exit. And if they... Yeah, I didn't pick up on the island bit either. Although it was really hard to tell. That was one of the things I thought was a bit lacking in this book was descriptions of geography we're all with reference to other countries and we have no idea where those countries are. They ba- they have a general east west to them, but like it was really hard to follow where placement was on there. I did get the feeling that it was a relatively small country be- maybe in part because I can't imagine putting a barrier over a massive country, but <laughs> yeah. Oh, Karis did say he was from the mainland. Okay, well that that would it would make sense to be an island like but i imagine a lot of that has to just do with where the spires located not anything else uh they might have been put they might have expanded at some point but been pushed back because of that six year war that occurred but yeah it's it's hard to tell without expanding the world more it's obviously our setting never leaves the the practically the single city right um but you know it it very well could be they're on an island and surrounded by like there might be an island and a lake in a surrounding country or they might be like a japan setting might be an australia setting we don't know (laughs) yeah yeah and via straight to to your point uh I think that's kind of part of what I'm talking about as being an issue is we have three people here and none of us have like a solid idea of how the world looks based on just the descriptions. I don't know if there's a map with a hardcover. This one I was not able to get in time. I tried to order it and the order messed up. And so audiobook I did for this one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, something that we can probably pretty quickly look up here. Patients, uh, map of yeah. Why don't you look that up while I figure out my stupid keyboard here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I um, yeah. The the setting of this book is obviously not as important as establishing the story um, in terms of what the author was trying to trying to get at right so yeah oh shit well that and establishing the uh, you can you can actually do a fairly good job of establishing like political rivalries without needing proximity to be a thing you know uh, yeah. And 
I think that was the more important bit was establishing the rivalries and the political games that happened between not only the people, but the gods even, <laughs> you know, the, uh, what is the word that I'm looking for? What were the, uh, gods of the spires called? Uh, like, I know they called them gods and goddesses, but they had another term for them. Apparently there is a map. Yeah. And... Um. Looks, uh, huh. Yeah, that that might explain why I had no idea what was going on. <laughs> because that's a pretty complicated map for uh, what they were trying to describe. Uh, see here, we were in East Edria. Oh, yep, yeah, bottom right corner. Phoenix Spire. And Serpent Spires right there on the oh. east side. Yeah, I don't... Yeah, it's kind of... Hmm. Uh-oh, Adam, we can't see you. Really? Yep, I don't know what happened, but we cannot see you. All right, so you're all going to have to look at my ugly mug. All right. <laughs> so... Do, That's weird. It's showing me and Skype as being there. Uh, it's not for me. I apologize for the technical difficulty as we have no idea what's going on behind that. But uh, Let's see here. Nope, I just tried. All right. Uh, let's try and keep this... <laughs> Uh, I'll try and keep this going for the time being. Uh, so, specifically, I was going to go over the tensions that uh, the author was able to create between, like, uh, let's see, the different towns, uh, like, at, well, these nation cities, really. Oh, Andy's back. Yeah, Welcome. sorry about that. <laughs> so what did you think about the like uh like what did you feel that uh the kind of like uh like the city rivalries lent to the story or didn't lend to the story like the city rivalry well the city like the uh city nation rivalries like Every spire has a city, and there's a nation built around spire cities, essentially. So what did you think about, like, the rivalries between the towers, like, the, the cities, both the people and, I guess, the gods, too? But Yeah, it's kind of kind of hard to tell, really, because, I mean, as far as the um, visages go, it seemed like the visages were all simpatico, right? Because... What's his name was there to look for Tenjin because Tenjin was gone. Um, Katashi was there to look for Tenjin. So, like, obviously, Katashi and Tenjin get along real well. <laughs> but, you know, the nations, I don't know. We get the idea that the military is necessary, that they're fighting some sort of war. Um, so, obviously, there's something there that. <clears throat> There's an ongoing conflict of unknown scale where obviously everybody doesn't get along because it's kind of just accepted in the society, I think, that, yep, there's going to be war and we're going to be fighting it and we're going to be in it. And it's like a prominent feature of our culture to join the army and go fight. <laughs> so curious how it's going to expand once we actually get out of our one little city <laughs> <laughs> see and that's the like thank you for bringing it around because that was the bit that i wanted to get to is like specifically i thought a lot of this was mostly a setup for the adventure outwards um there i think it was showing that like the rivalries that the gods do have, because they do talk about some minor tensions between some of the gods, is more so of a like, we're kind of above it all, uh, you know, but at the same time, we're going to protect our followers. 
and I I don't think the, the gods quite can divorce themselves from their followers to the point of having no vested interest in war whatsoever. Yeah. Um, which it seems to be impl- like both implied that they are and aren't invested in it. So I think there is something more going on in the background than just I'm following my brother around. I think there is a dissident among the gods, but again, like I'm getting too much of predictions, but I think a lot of that is set up for showing the interplay between humans and gods and showing that while they are their own individual beings, they aren't completely divorced from their people, you know? Uh, And I think you can kind of get something of a sense of which ones might not like each other to an extent based on the tensions between people. You know, I know it gets a little bit dicey when you start bringing in the sentience of the different beings into play. Like, uh, I've already forgotten his name, the name of the... uh, Katashi? uh, No, no, the uh, thing that uh, Sarah summons... uh, Vavine. Serio? Oh, no, Veneve? V- yeah, uh, Veneve. Yeah, Veneve. Uh, <laughs> so many names. <laughs> so many names. So many. Okay, so Veneve, uh, Veneve starts talking, like, is a separate entity, but it, like, makes an, uh, there's a line that stuck with me is, I think, uh, Sarah asked it was like, would you be okay killing your own kind? He's like, well, it's no different than humans killing humans. And it is able to separate itself entirely. And that was the one piece that kind of threw my theory, uh, threw a wrench into my theory is that it just might be that they are like, yeah, we've got our own shit going on. We'll protect you where we can. If you're a devoted enough follower and you follow enough of like what we value, but you know, like, our shit's our shit your shit is your shit for the most part (laughs) you know as long as you don't fuck with us and i thought that was kind of it it, i I, again uh, that interplay though i think is going to come out a lot more going forward in the future books yeah yeah, uh, via straight. That's a perfect way of putting it. Yeah, the visages do squabble like siblings. I think it's going to play out like these sibling rivalries turn into something much bigger <laughs> on a human scale, <laughs> like just because of the nature of like power scaling, really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, he is a prof. Uh, Andrew Rowe is apparently a professional game designer. Yeah, that really makes sense that he would draw from that because, honestly, this is something I could see very easily being put into a game. Um, But I will say there are some nuances to this that I found kind of fun to read about that you don't get from games. And um, maybe that's a good question to ask is, what is something that you thought this book brought to the table that a you know, if this were a game, it wouldn't have been able to bring. Uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of talk scenes that would be extremely monotonous in a video game, right? Um, a lot of the enchanting stuff would uh, not really fit with the rest of the the book in terms of gameplay. I think. You can you can't really spend hours enchanting and then also hours fighting. Like that that game would be a little too diverse, I think. But <clears throat> yeah, and I I think uh, that's a good point. Is that this is so highly diverse that trying to shove all of that into a game might get a little overcrowded, like. Maybe not even a single like you maybe you wouldn't do it in a single game is like maybe every tower has its own game, but um yeah, you don't 
I actually find it to be a positive, though, that it can bring in some of that nuance to the magic system that you just don't get out of games. In games, there's a lot of dismissal of stuff of like, oh, well, it just doesn't work, so we don't need to know why. We don't need to know. The lo- we don't need to know the lore of why. We just know like it becomes a very mathematical formula or complete trial and error, depending on the type of game style that you play. Whereas this, you kind of get a better feel for what it's like to actually practically have to practice magic with a rule system like that. As a you know, despite it being in a very RPG t- style setting, um, it the talk scenes I'm with VS Drake, uh, yeah, you get that in like D and D style RPGs, like that <laughs> very much so happens. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm pretty sure we had a similar discussion about how that magic stuff worked, so uh, like just two sessions ago in my own D and D campaign that I play in. <laughs> Yeah, VS Jake, Arden did mention at one point that her and Tristan were considering Corin for um, joining their specific sect of Whispers. Um, but obviously him, his actions in favor of Katashi might be a little bit against their two particular stances, but... Again, also, Tristan also said at the end that um, he didn't mind that he took out Orden. <laughs> I didn't uh, quite get that vibe via straight that it was like one whisper per visage. I just thought it was kind of we keep it to a bare minimum of people. We They wanted at least one per visage just for coverage more than anything was kind of the feel that I got for it. And because they're so exclusive about it, you're only going to get in with if essentially a referral on who better to refer you than your dead brother. Dead brother. <laughs> not, <laughs> you're not you're, so dead brother. <laughs> yeah, you're not so dead brother. Um, speaking of which, did either did anybody uh, make that uh, make any predictions about uh, Tristan that wound up coming true or that were just a hard miss. <laughs> yeah, I, I pretty early on thought that just story wise it made sense for the book persona to be Tristan because there wasn't really any other characters mentioned in the story that were a total mystery. Um, I talked to Storm about this earlier actually, but he he put out there the book could have been Corin and Tristan's mom. Um, but my counter for that was uh, Sarah knew where their mom was at all times up until the, the, the school year. So I think I, I felt like it, he, he was pretty, he made sense as the voice. Yeah, I I actually, like, right from the beginning, figured that the book was his brother, but I thought it was his brother had been... Turned was, into a book? <laughs> like, well, it was somehow entrapped in the book, or that was his only means of communication. Like, he was trapped in the tower, and the book was, like, somehow bound to him. Like, it ended up being much more malevolent than that, like, potentially, depending on your view uh, yeah. um and whether or not you believe what tristan ends up saying at the end about how he had left his teacher behind because she was going insane <laughs> <laughs> because she couldn't let go or something like that but like i from the beginning like i was like i bet anything that's his brother just like somehow trapped or tethered to the book you know, especially with the illusion of like him finding it right before finding jail cells where people were literally like kept. And I was like, oh, well, he's probably like in a similar cell and somehow has this is bound to this book, whether that's within the book or within the tower. But yeah, it ended up being a, a little bit more than that, which was a nice little twist, something I didn't predict. 
you know. You know, so I, yeah. I got that it was him writing, but I was off base on why and how. <laughs> Presumably, anyway. Yeah, it was, was a uh, list. It was definitely a good way to end the book. You know, little brother. <laughs> 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 all right yeah it was a good it was fun it was just like as at like as i was reading as that was being read i was just like yep it's him it's him it's him yep there it is <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's jump to via strake's question again uh world building all right thoughts on the world building um I think we've kind of like touched on this in pieces already, but to bring it together as a whole, I think the world building revolving around like magic and what life is like, at least in um, the city surrounding the serpent spire was pretty well done. I think the world, there's a foundation being laid for the rest of the world, but I don't think that was done quite as well with anything that didn't regard specifically the other spires and that one a uh, nation that is constantly at war with Korans. I can't even remember them because, again, like there's enough names to remember, and <laughs> I don't remember the names of the yeah. nations. But you know, aside from those particular, uh, aside from that, I think there was this. I almost wish there wasn't quite as much about the rest of the world outside of the spires. Just kind of like it, it might have made it a little more ominous maybe there's something that will be followed through in like the n- coming books but i thought the greater world building like the large scale world building not so great but like the more intimate stuff within the school within the magic system uh i thought was pretty well done i could pretty vividly see what it would be like to live and work in that or or be a part of that city uh nation and how there's like a caste system to it as well and you kind of get a feel for that it was it was good i would say above average but the thing that really holds it together i think is the magic system for this like that's the bit of the world building that i think really brings everything together that and the the lore behind the towers and the god and the gods and the visages, I thought that was really, really well done. Like that's what really had me hooked. Yeah, I think um, Roe did a really good job of expanding in stages. Like he didn't just sit there and focus on characters for ten chapters and then sit there and focus on magic for ten chapters. He did a really good job of giving you pieces of this, pieces of that, branching out further here, branching out further there, using this action over here to expand over there. I thought the expanse of the the way he expanded upon the knowledge base was really well done. <clears throat> yeah, I'd have that's a really good point about um, expanding in stages enough that like as we like like i said he's really he was really good about giving you a foundation for what was to come next and rather than laying it all down in chunks letting the world slowly grow from a very core the core of which being corn and the tower and literally expanding out from those singular points so good point there and uh vs drake loved the world building uh, felt it was super deep and there's a great history I agree there about the great history and and at, and it goes straight into your point Adam of not flooding you with too much info all at once yeah and of, and of course the swearing it was, uh, <laughs> what was what was uh, Corin's yeah. go to like Resh or something yeah Resh <laughs> Resh <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm pretty sure uh I think every book uh, in the like, it's it. I think every book that we've had something like that, it's been worth pointing out. Like, all right, what's the swear word for this uh, world? 
and I've, I've been I've actually been surprised at like how good people are at coming up with a word that kind of get, has that same evocative notion with the, uh, that same evocative catharsis to saying it as like shit or fuck, but yeah. it's rash. Like it's got like it's something I can say with the same kind of cathartic energy or uh, for whatever emotion that it's attached to, which was. Yeah, it has oomph. It has oomph. That's a good way to put it. Yes, our, our already known swear words have already flooded our life so much at this point. <laughs> like, they don't have impact where a brand new one does. Well, I think I think <laughs> the ones that we have now do maybe less than they used to. But yeah, it is nice to have fresh new ones to be like, yep, there's a reason why this works. We like it just has that oomph, that <laughs> je ne sais quoi. <laughs> 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 I don't know what that means. I don't know what it literally translates to, but essentially that essence. Je ne sais quoi translates to like you don't something you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it has that something that I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But yeah, it is a great way to immerse somebody because it's like it's a good way to get you to attach yourself to like the emotions behind language because there's like no other way to interpret it other than like yeah, well, rash, <laughs> 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 you know, like, and I think that you're right, VS3. That does help. It's like I don't. It has that I don't know what that essence is. Literally, <laughs> what I had said is like I don't know what it's called, but it has that <laughs> je ne sais quoi. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So where where did this book fall short? Um, I think the big things that stood out to me are again some of the confusion around like the world. Part of it's because there's just so much being lobbed at you all, uh, like overall in this book. But the other thing that I thought, I'm actually, I'm going to preface this by saying, I'm not sure if this was the fault of the book or my fault as a reader, <laughs> but I found myself being pulled away from the story in favor of being just purely curious about the magic and the lore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I want to know more about this stuff, so I'm going to seek it out and I'm going to pay more attention to these things and I'm going to spend the time in between trying to put pieces together based on what I'm learning and what's coming, you know, what new information has been provided. And it kind of at times took me out of the story because he created such an interesting lore and such an interesting magic system. It sometimes took away from the story for me. And it was a lot harder also to get attached to most of the characters. I mean, in part because it was a big, yeah, it was a big main cast and it's not as if we've had, we haven't had books that have, you know, quite a few people in it. It's just when you combine those two things, you end up with a lot of placeholder style characters where they tend to be a little bit one dimensional and you don't get as much out of them. We learn a lot through Korn's. We, we know a lot about Korn just because we learn about stuff through his eyes, but even he does, he doesn't go through, a lot of personal transformation until like right at the very end. Mm -hmm. And some of it was very much so earned. Some of it wasn't. I do like though. Uh, I know we're not answering this question. Uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll save it for later, uh, a later question. But yeah, my, my fault with this is just that the, the world building for the magic system and the lore was so good that sometimes it just kind of took you out of took me out of the story and i have a tendency to do that with like rpg like rpg style stuff where i'm still figuring out the lore and the magic systems of these worlds so i know it goes beyond this book and that's where i don't know if it's me or the book yeah so take that with a grain of salt anybody who's watching this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I definitely think Ro bit off a giant chunk of cake with this book. Like, there was just so much he wanted to put in there. Uh, one thing I think he did well uh, that you kind of talked about a little bit, though, is um, the interesting side quests of magic. 
Like, I think he knew when he was writing it that it was pulling away from the story because he kept, he constantly had Corrin say things like, oh, I'll add it to my infinite list of things to get done. Like, <laughs> like he, he, in the story, mentioned, like, yeah, I know, there's a lot of shit. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he definitely got a little meta with that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. But for me, the the biggest miss of this book was the balance of the magic. Uh, specifically at the very end, uh, we hear throughout the entire book how insanely powerful emeralds are. And it's like, 60 is carnelian, 6 times 60, so 360 is, what is it, sunstone? Yeah. 6 C- times C- citrine. citrine. And sunstone. Yeah. I don't remember which comes next, but so six times that is the next one. Six times that is emerald, right? So oh, it is sunstone then citrine because it's colors of the rainbow. So yeah. carnelian's red, sunstone's orange, citrine is yellow, emerald is green. So oh, twenty-one sixty for the middle one. Twelve thousand nine hundred sixty mana for. Emerald, right? Something like that. Yeah, so you're something. telling you're telling me a guy who has at minimum twelve thousand nine hundred sixty mana at his command <laughs> couldn't take on a couple of first years. <laughs> yeah, I thought the power scaling was a bit weird in this because I don't one of the things that I had trouble uh, I just try uh, tried to accept was just that just because you have access to mana, your ability to use it effectively is not necessarily the same. So power scaling, like you can be a Carnelian that uses your shit incredibly effectively and you can probably power scale for shorter time against somebody who's a lot better than you. But again, eventually, yeah, it does get outweighed by that specific example that you gave for an emerald with what you said 12,000 something yeah 12 minimum. 12 960 <laughs> yeah and who has multiple attunements no less up against a couple of first years who granted hacks had the goddess of the tower on the side of their summoner the one thing though is you kind of see that a lot in jrpgs too um where somebody with lesser power gets access to very temporary major boosts in power that supersede, that will supersede or overcome like a power gap, but there's typically a huge price for it, which is exactly what happens to Sarah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it, you know, there's like, yeah, she was able to do this amazing thing and effectively be an emerald, but at the cost of potentially not being able to fully speak ever again. <laughs> <laughs> like, so the that idea of short term power ups for uh, at the at a major cost isn't is something I guess I I'm fairly used to in that at least in that genre, and that's something that I kind of had tied to it from the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, those old DBZ knocked down, but uh, but then the dramatic uh, hidden power reveals that come afterwards. Unfor, <laughs> <laughs> and then the god effectively acting as a senzu bean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. So I will say, uh, I have read the second book, and it does get addressed in the second book. So I think, I think Ro kind of felt the same way i felt where it was like okay the students shouldn't have won against an emerald <laughs> <laughs> let's retcon some shit shall we <laughs> at the very beginning of the second book it does retcon it and say orden specifically told Derek, you can't kill the kids you can't summon your guys out of your swords just take them down yeah so that would make sense then, because you're basically putting a major handicap on them. Um, that is one thing I also wasn't really sure about with the magic system, is your ability to gain 
magic through use. Yeah, it works a lot like tra- like muscle training would work in the real world where, you know, lift heavy, get bigger, eat the right stuff, get bigger <laughs> type of increases in power. But then, like you said, this is six times more per person and they are gaining like 10 per week now is this like you gain a percentage or something i this is me this is me going this is my mind throughout the book is ignoring the story and i'm like how does that work how do we get to six times when it takes him like four months to gain like 20 yeah (laughs) and And that sort of stuff would take me out of the story. You know, like that's where my mind would go. And I'm glad that the next book has more of those answers. But I think to your point, Adam, there was a lot bitten off in this book. And I'm hoping that the series, as it continues, fleshes out some of the characters. Because I would like to know more about characters like Sarah beyond the she's effectively a prodigy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh why am i blanking on her name the one who is the badass who punched lightning oh, <laughs> uh, um marissa yeah marissa uh i'd like to know more about those characters i want to know more about uh You know, I do want to know more about cadence beyond the i must find my brother and i'm going to you know and i'm going to you know, try all these really cool enchanter uh, combinations that nobody else thinks to. Like, because I, I guess I get very much similar vibes to. Um, wow, I am so bad with names. The main character from Name of the Wind. Um, Adam, which, you, which, you, which you, one? Main, the main character from Quoth? Name of the Wind. Yeah, Quoth. Like similar vibes to Kvothe while he's in the middle of school, like when he's make when he's making magic when he's making his own magical items. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so much shame. <laughs> Tell me about it. I'm running on like two hours of sleep, guys. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> but like I'm I'm getting similar vibes to that. Like he's got that kind of curious mind, and I love that in a character, but I want more depth to uh, that's why I want to see more depth from Corin. You know? Yeah. I think we got a little bit of that, like, uh, when he got asked out to the dance by Jin. I thought that was... I thought that scene was just fucking adorable. Where he's just like, I don't really see people that way, but he is nice to look at. Oh, and then all of a sudden he's like, oh, I got a date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I felt like... I felt like the... Um... What's the word I'm looking for? Um, the <clears throat> never mind. I can't think of the word. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I felt I felt like Ro did a really good job of integrating um not damn it the word is tip of my tongue <laughs> I, you haven't given me enough context for me to be able to like help you get there i feel okay i'll go a different i feel like he did a really good job of promoting acceptance towards non-standard alignments in terms of relationships yeah, I, I agree. Uh, with a when they were when they introduced that as a concept, like relationships, really don't come in until like until that scene where they're talking, where he's talking with. Um, uh, well, it comes in a little bit earlier when it, the guy who winds up being his, uh, I think oh, it's Patrick. Pa- Patrick, yeah, when he's talking with Patrick about Sarah, like relationships other than like familial relationships and friendships and stuff are like romantic relationships are pretty much skipped over until that point. And 
when it gets brought up, it's just kind of like, this is just kind of how life is, is that we accept it. Like, there's no idea of there being any sort of, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, uh, prejudice against people who uh, love people of the same gender. Like, it, it's just kind of like, it is what it is. And I, I also really like the pro, but is specifically for Corin. I like the process that he went through. He's like, I generally don't like being touched, and I generally don't have romantic feelings towards people. But he's nice to look at, and that, and you know, he's smart and he has all these qualities. And then when he gets all giddy that he's got a date, it's just like, yep, that sounds like a teenager who hasn't really thought about sexuality at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and like the re- and it's just treated as like it. It brings in a pretty universal experience and leaves the lgbtq representation as kind of like a like it's just a normal thing like it's not calling attention to it but it's not shying away from it either it's just this is somebody who's realizing that he might have a thing for somebody else for another guy like that's it it's just like I, I have a thing for this person and that's all it is and that's i really like when it's treated like that because that normalizes the experience I liked I liked how at no point did he go, but he's a guy. You know, he didn't question it at any point. He was just like, how do I feel about this person? Not, do I need to think about whether it's a guy or a girl? <clears throat> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Exactly. You, there's no thought. There's no second thought about that. It's just, do I have an attraction to this person or not? And I thought that was really well done and it didn't it that was probably the most depth of character moment too for corin that goes beyond his obsession with magic and finding his brother so i i thought it humanized him a bit more it made me want to know more about him and i think that's a really good use of romance because so you know talk about this before we wind up getting into our romance like leading up to our romance week that we've got coming up but I thought that was a really good use of like a romantic moment to lend depth to a character without taking away from the story and all. Yep. Or making it just about, or, you know, because a lot of like these teen romance things will just go into the drama of it and make that and like try and use that to create tension. And yeah, you can create tension between people because of romance, but it was nice to have it done without creating drama to do it. Was my point. So, yeah, not not like um. What what do you? Vs Vs Drake asks, was this an entertaining book, a technically good book, both or neither? I, for me, I think. It was an entertaining book, yes. I think it was a good, not great book it, from from a technical standpoint. There's a lot of. I think this, like, I think because it's entertain, it is entertaining in part because Ro has that background in creating games, so he knows entertaining story points. He knows how to create a world or system that is entertaining. But truly great books will pull you can do that while also pulling in pulling you into in and, and making you invest in the characters in the world. And I was less invested in the characters in the world themselves as I was just learning the secrets type of thing. And I think that's the difference between it being like a great book. Uh, you know, like it is I think any book that is entertaining is good. Yeah. But to be like a really great book, it needs to have an extra level that I don't think this has. But if all you're looking for is entertainment, like <laughs> absolute, like if you're if you want like a literary masterpiece, this is not it. But if you want a truly entertaining book and one that like gets your brain tickling and like you know gets uh, get your gears turning about lore and about magic systems and stuff like that with a lot of potential for story. 
this definitely hits that. And uh... yeah, yeah, I I would agree. I think the book was highly entertaining, um, but like for a great work of literature art, I look for something that's gonna, you know. Uh, speed my heart beat up uh, make me stay up late reading um, hit me in the feels make me think about my own life in some way you know all those things are what I look for in a great book where this was entertaining um, on a, a really high level of entertainment yeah. but at no point was I like I'm going to introspect here for a minute and think about my own life based on what I just read you know. Yeah, it seems like for the most part, via straight us. Uh, it wasn't. Sorry. I can't put it down level. <laughs> yeah, <it> definitely. <clears throat> yeah, this. Uh, there, were, there was enough entertainment in for me where I was. If I had been physically reading the book, I definitely would have been able to put it down. It's not the I can't put it down, but. The thing is, is I was listening to it and admittedly threw a good chunk of it playing Minecraft. Um, (laughs) So I could let my mind wander about the parts that I wasn't, you know, particularly invested in. And I could let my mind wander about the parts that I really wanted to know about and then come back into it when the story started picking up or if I was learning something new. You know, like I was still listening to it the whole time, but... Yeah, it was definitely one of those ones where it was enter- very entertaining and it kept my mind going, but it was not really huge into it. I, I'm i not going to get too big into that Harry Potter one because that's a whole <laughs> separate discussion, which maybe someday we'll get to, but... <laughs> I feel like I feel like we could discuss the entire series. If you haven't read Harry Potter by now, then you've been living under a rock, I guess. <laughs> no, I, I'm just saying, like, uh, we might need to do like just a special episode on that where we get BS <laughs> on and we just, you know, duke it out. <laughs> All right, I've got, sim- I've got stories. simmer down BS straight. We got. You. <laughs> All right, you got any more topics? Or are we gonna break into our final thoughts here? Um, I wanted to quickly do like, uh, I think we actually did a pretty good job on covering final thoughts unless you had something you wanted to add, but I did want to do a predictions for this one. Let's do, uh, me me versus BS, uh, me BS Drake. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Close it, Emerald. (laughs) No, because you've already read the next book, but like. The glowing silver bitches. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so let's let's do a final thoughts slash predictions then. You right. can you can go ahead and kick it off. Okay, so it kind of like I was making predictions through this whole thing, and it kind of ruined my prediction. Like at the very end, when it turns out his brother's like, "Ha it was me all along." Um, I was the book all along. Me, <laughs> it was me. <laughs> um, so overall. I thought it was an entertaining book. It's something that I would recommend to anybody who you don't necessarily need to be a gamer, but who appreciates like RPG style tropes, who likes high fantasy. This definitely fits in there. It's got a fun magic system uh, to walk through. It's not going to be a melt your face off storyline, but it's entertaining enough to keep it moving and keep you invested through most of it. Uh, You know, it's, you know, I might not have wanted to like, never put it down but i also didn't want to throw it away either so (laughs) yeah yeah, it's definitely something that i would recommend if nothing else because it is fun to make some of these predictions like one of the things i predict is that there is a there there is a either missing god or one of the gods that they know one of the visages is like manipulating the others there is a there there is one that is like the shit stir <laughs> um, that is like going behind this. I also predict that by the end of it, um, they find out that the the gods are actual gods and not just people turned into gods. 
That's that. Those are like the main things. Like I said, uh, that and I think at least by the end of this, I'm not sure who it'll be. I'm torn between Corn and Sarah, but I think one of them, one or both of them, will wind up having their attunements ascended. I think. I think. I think Sarah's already on that way. Based, yeah, she'd based be my. What happened to she'd her? She'd be my. <laughs> she, well, the other one that might it maybe it maybe might happen to might be Marissa, but there's not enough from her. For like, we learned too much about Sarah. Like, if I had to put money down, my guess would be Sarah. But I think so. I think the visages are regular people. Um. I think they're essentially what um, we kind of didn't even touch on, like the main freaking plot of this book at all. But um, there, let's be real, there wasn't a huge amount to the plot. So yeah. it's kind of so. So the the main plot was that there was an organization creating god beast people, and the reason why. The the kid, unconscious kid, and what was her name, Vera or something, was in the tower was to test the god beast creation kid. Um, I really think the visages are those uh, human created god beasts, and that they essentially did what happened to Tenjin to the goddess. I think they captured the goddess, locked her away somewhere, and took over. So I think I think we're seeing the next evolution of that cycle where, again, people are coming into the power where they can take back over and kick out the, the rulers and establish their own rule. Oh, you reminded me of one of my other predictions where I think, and uh, so did VS drink a little bit there but uh i think that they are gods in the sense that they are higher beings but i think they are kind of like ancient aliens types of type gods where or like the eternals or something where they came from a planet where they are fairly ordinary like they like what you're talking about is normal and like the ability to gain that sort of power is normal and they just took over (laughs) here Like, I I, I don't know. I just get this feeling like they either, whether it's from the mainland, quote unquote, like B.S. Drake is saying, or if it is from another planet and they just kind of took over this island of nation where they like, that's kind of what I meant by gods, not like full on omnipotent, like the hot, uh, you know, the uh, capital G God, but like, you know, sufficiently advanced magic. It is like I get that from sufficiently advanced magic being close enough to sufficiently advanced technology is magic. <laughs> so sufficiently advanced magic is goddom. That's where I'm getting that from. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean that's kind of what I think. <sighs> Mind blown BS Drake. What if the mainland is another planet? <laughs> <laughs> That is that is something book two kind of touches on too is why the attunements work how they work in terms of starting you off weak and then growing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not going to spoil it. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely I will say this as a part of the final thoughts. I do very much want to read the next book, and I think that's a sign of a good book. Is yeah. it great? No, but it's good enough that I want to read the next one. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm definitely with VS Drake earlier when he said he really enjoyed the world building. Um, to me, this book is just building up the world, building up the magic system, uh, kind of the characters, but more on that later. Uh, and uh, book two continues that thread. There's a lot more expansion in book two, which is good. Uh, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I found it highly entertaining. Um, back back when I first read this the first time, I immediately read the second one right after. 
Uh, and I have started the second one again. <laughs> I'm about I'm about halfway through the second one so far. So it's good. It's very good. I would definitely recommend it. Yes, and I would definitely recommend it, especially to anybody who likes high fantasy or RPGs of any kind. You yeah, know, yeah. or JRPGs or anything like that. I'd recommend it to pretty much. You know, I, I'm probably not going to recommend it to like light readers unless those light readers are also gamers but anybody who's a heavy gamer or heavy heavy reader i'd recommend it to yeah that's a good way to put it all uh, right final final thoughts here or that, sorry I, uh finishing wrap up discussions here <laughs> I, I think uh, i think we're ready to just wind it down uh so we do have our uh vote in uh so remember our next book is for january 29th that is the odyssey by homer going for our classics week uh, and we just got our vote in for the weekend of valentine's day but it's going to be on february 12th uh the book is Always Have, Always Will, uh, Always Have, Always Will by Sophia Hahn, uh, who's actually a friend of the show. So please come around, ch- uh, start reading those books, uh, and join us for uh, what I'm hoping what I'm hoping will be a fun foray into two new themes: classics and romance. So we'll see where those wind <laughs> wind up taking us. <laughs> Yeah, there is no oh, there is no audiobook for Always Have Always Will. It is not super long though. So, uh keep in mind you will uh you can get e- uh you can get ebooks of it though. So you don't have to necessarily have a physical copy. Uh just download Kindle if you need to. Uh but you know, you know, maybe there's something to be said for the intimacy of reading a physical book for a romance week. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And uh, February, we will be doing uh, our next book will be another. Uh, we will be doing a Black History Week this week, uh, this year. Uh, I think we all really enjoy doing black history month but we still and so we still want to represent it but we're trying to keep our themes to a week rather than whole months so we can get more of them in a little more variety so uh if you have any new ones let us know any new ones by black authors that you would love to see us have on our list let us know before the end of the day tomorrow so we can get it into our vote and coming up after that uh we'll be doing uh well, I think I still need a moment to come up with a new theme because I know we want to do at least one women's one for uh, for March as well. But I am still kind of workshopping the next theme. So for now, let's just focus on <laughs> the next one coming up, which is going to be uh, our Black History Week. So join us for those. And why don't you throw out our plugs for this week, Adam? Yeah. Uh, first, do you know if there's any sort of warning we need to give for the new book? Um, do you know anything about I would. It? I have been saving. I, I've technically had the book for a couple months now, but I've been saving it to in case it wound up on our list. Um, <laughs> and so I don't know offhand. I would just assume that this is the steamy type romance. So definitely, like, be prepared for it. I'm not sure if it's actually in there or not. So, um, you know, we uh, will have to wait and see for this one. I would not read it aloud to your kids. Let's put it that way. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there goes my plans. (laughs) Just kidding. Yeah. So plugs, uh, check out our main website out, dmstable.com. Uh, there you can find all the information you could ever want about dmstable.com, as well as the 800s, our podcast, World with Advantage, uh, other things we've done. It's all there. Check it out. YouTube. Check out the link below. It directs you to YouTube, where we post videos. <laughs> and Patreon. Of course, that's how we keep the lights on, is by Patreons, patrons from Patreon. That's uh, patreon.com slash dmstable. 
Uh, join us there. Two dollars, uh, I believe, is still our lowest offering for for cool stuff. So, just two bucks a month, and you get things. Uh, otherwise, you can hit us up on our socials. Uh, check out our posts about books and other nerdy topics. Uh, Facebook is at the DMs table, and Twitter is at DMs table. So check those out. And if you check those out, and you're like, man, these guys say a lot of cool things. I wish I could like talk to them whenever I want and then it'll send like notifications to each of their individual phones and all that cool <laughs> stuff. And maybe you should join our Discord server where we talk all things nerdy, including books, D and D, three D printing, <laughs> other <laughs> topics. <laughs> Hit us up on our socials and we'll get you that link for our Discord server and you can join us for our many nerdy topics and then of course we already talked about our themes upcoming themes we got classics for two weeks from now uh, romance for four weeks from now uh, black history for six weeks from now and other things coming up in the future <laughs> <laughs> the future <laughs> <laughs> yeah we know we're nailing this one via straight <laughs> i thought that was perfection okay? <laughs> what are you talking about that was my best sales pitch ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, uh, also if anybody uh, i will say this if anybody does have themes that they want us to go that they would love to see us do feel free to submit mm -hmm. themes as well even if you don't have books and we'll see if and where we can fit them in. And who knows? Maybe if you've got a Patreon, we might pay a little more attention. Winkity wink. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, thank you, everybody, can, for joining. I can personally guarantee you that absolutely no other show, podcast, live stream has the same authenticity and genuine reading off the screen quality that I have. Okay? <laughs> you cannot find that anywhere but the 800s. <laughs> False advertising suits. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. This was a fun chat. Uh, you know, looking forward to reading the next book with you. Yeah, thanks guys. It was fun. Hope you come back for more. <laughs> See you next book. Look, the main character is cool. <laughs>